Welcome everyone to today's event. My name is Nicole Brown and I'm very excited to present to you today on modern methods of construction. As we open today, I'd like to extend my and acknowledge the traditional owners and the first peoples across our country today. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples from across Australia and their continuing connection to country. I would also like to extend my acknowledgement to our Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal colleagues who are joining us on the call today. Noting that this call is a trans-Tasman trans group, I would also like to welcome our New Zealand colleagues and clients. Tenakato, Tenakato, Tenakato Katoa. As I mentioned, my name is Nicole Brown and I'm a structural engineer in the Buildings and Places team in the Melbourne office of AECOM. And I've been working with the, our modular construction group for the past few years and very excited to present to you today. As many of you know, the construction industry is at a breaking point. And adding to the existing pressures of fragmentation, productivity and skills shortages is the increasing pressure to reduce carbon emissions and overcome the one-off mentality that so many of us face on our projects in construction as we move towards, uh, as we want to move towards a circular economy. It is now widely recognised that off-site construction is an effective form of construction as a sustainable and efficient solution or alternative to the more traditional construction methods. However, the question we're asking today is, are we moving fast enough? to realise the full extent of the benefits that modular methods of construction can bring to our industry. What role does policy play in driving this change and to enable more widespread adoption? What can we do as professionals in this industry to better foster a more integrated and systemised approach to construction while unlocking innovative design approaches that are often too inhibited by fragmented uh, procurement processes? I will note that this is also the second in a four part series that ACOM is hosting on thriving places in which the aim of these webinars is to explore ways in which we can future proof buildings and places in a response to a globally changing landscape or rapidly changing global landscape, I should say. So let me introduce our incredible panelists that we have today, and I thank each of them for agreeing to contribute to this discussion. Firstly, we have Andrew Miller, who's a Senior Construction Manager in Buildings at Lendlease. He works within the, building re uh, the Victorian building region of uh, Lendlease and has been with Lendlease for over 19 years, the majority of which focused on healthcare delivery. And he's been involved in tendering and delivery of eight different healthcare facilities in Melbourne, including MC, PPP and DNC delivery methods. Welcome, Andrew. We also have Luke Belfield, who's the Victorian Chief Engineer working in the Office of Projects Victoria. He is a champion for engineering and project delivery excellence and works collaboratively with industry, academic experts, delivery agencies on technical design and engineering aspects of both government service and project delivery. He leads their innovation and engineering team responsible for advancing engineering in Victoria and leading technical infrastructure innovation He's an experienced infrastructure professional with over 15 years in the industry in areas of policy, technology and business strategy and project management. Welcome, Luke. We also have John Norman joining us from Woods Bagot, where he's an associate principal. John has led significant public, commercial, retail, residential, aged care and educational projects and has a wide range of experience in architecture and master planning. He works closely within the design team to ensure clients' expectations are met via a full design delivery service, including design, project management and documentation. His holistic approach to architecture involves substantial experience in all phases of projects, from design and design development, delivery to completion. Welcome, John. And last but not least, we have Joyce Fernge, who's an Associate Director and Modular Lead at ACOM in Melbourne, Victoria. She's currently working within the, the modular space and has delivered numerous modular projects from the feasibility study right through to the final construction completion. 
and she is extremely passionate in pushing the boundaries of modular, working closely with digital disruptors and to looking to ways to integrate technology from Industry 4.0. Welcome, Joyce. So let's jump into the discussion that we have for you today. If anyone does have any questions throughout, we do have a structured discussion that we'll start with, but if you do have any questions for the panelists throughout, please do post them in the Q&A channel and we'll be able to respond to these at the end of the session. So let's start from the start. How would you describe the current landscape of modern methods of construction in Australia and New Zealand? So Joyce, I'll start with you. So you just have to unmute yourself, Joyce. Perfect. Okay. How would you describe this. how would you describe thing. the current landscape of modern methods of construction in Australia and New Zealand? Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, I would describe it as the current landscape as actually very promising. It is great to see interest and signs of uptake within the industry, especially post-pandemic. However, I still think we still have quite a journey to go compared to the other countries. From the recent Prefab Boss conference that I attended, it has been highlighted that offsite comprises only a 5% of the total construction industry in Australia. That is a very, very small fraction. Whereas in other parts of the world, it ranges between 40 to 50%. If we look at it from a different lens, this figures indicates the amount of missed opportunity we had to harness the benefits of offsite. Thanks very much, Joyce. It definitely is a low percentage in comparison. So we're interested in starting to understand more about the projects that we've currently got in the modular space at the moment. So, Andrew, could you please tell us about your experience with modern methods of construction uh, across Australia and what benefits that you've seen? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nicole, and uh, privilege to be here. Um, so as part of our Victorian business, we are delivering for the Department of Health in Victoria the Pathway 144 project, which is a $492 million health project for the department. Um, it's across four sites uh, within the Victorian region, three of which are um, through a modular construction um, frame. So we've got a site at Sunshine Hospital, one at Northern Hospital, and one in Geelong, which is the McKellar Centre Aged Care Facility, all being delivered as uh, as modular construction, which is exciting. Um, it's fair to say there is absolutely benefit in um, going down an MMC approach, um, and, and that ranges from being able to control uh, quality, safety, and obviously um, weather conditions in a in an offsite environment. Um, but the other thing, I. Uh, I think is important to note is that it's the benefit is most apparent um, when there is a standard concept layout um, considered um, and where there's repetition of planning in a healthcare environment. Um, I suppose it's really important from a modular point of view. Now that that's not always easy because you know health planners have specific requirements, health providers have specific requirements in terms of providing healthcare. Uh, we know it's not always easy to get bedrooms and en suites and specific care areas in a in a cookie cutter uh, a, a sort of setup. But um, where there can be repetition of planning and repetition of uh, layout of of structure and superstructure, that's where you see the real benefit of uh, of offsite modular construction. So um, we certainly we're we're mindful of uh, of that benefit, and it's it's fair to say that from a healthcare point of view. That is getting better. It's not easy. It is challenging, but that's certainly getting better as we uh, as we learn more along the way. Most definitely. Thanks for that, Andrew. So now going from a, a different perspective, and interested to hear your thoughts, John. Woods Baggett have been involved in delivering multiple projects within this space. How have you seen modern methods of construction being used to enable su successful project outcomes? Yeah, we've, we've been doing um, a fair bit of work with um, schools infrastructure in New South Wales um, to develop guidelines for schools and getting the guidelines in place so that along the lines of what Andrew was saying, 
you've got a, a framework to start with and you've got a good base to work off. And if you've got that set up at the beginning, then the delivery of that product is much easier to, to do. So we've just delivered a, a small school in, um, in Fern Bay up, up near Newcastle, uh, where we did a full vet volumetric um, primary school building there. Uh, working with Viridian and, and um, Lipman. Um, and it was very successful in terms of getting it on site, getting it built quickly. Some of the benefits that we've seen are around the, the sort of certainty in the, in the delivery of a product. You know what you're going to get when it gets delivered to site. Um, you get a better level of tolerance in the building um, because you're building off site. And importantly for schools, you, you have a very short period of construction on the actual uh, school site. So you're taking the risk of construction issues away from children, obviously not a great mix. So yeah, that's there. There's some of the benefits. The other benefits are that when we're doing multiple um, schools or doing multiple projects, we've got a, a kit of parts that we can then tap into um, to deliver a, um, a, a building typology that is focused more on its place versus what's in it, if that makes sense. What's in it is already sort of not pre-agreed, but, but it has a guideline that goes with it. So as long as you're meeting the guidelines, you, the, the focus isn't on redoing all the planning internally over and over and over. You've got one sort of guideline to follow. Perfect. I think those uh, having those, I guess, the lessons learned or the experiences within your own company to be able to then use that repetition and both you and Andrew have spoken around the importance or the benefits when there is similarities between projects that you can develop these concepts and the, the kit of parts, as you say, to be able to then apply to different areas. So I'm gonna, we're going to take a, a shift in focus now and look at, I guess, instead of from the delivery standpoint, looking at the experiences within government. So Luke, I'm going to call on yourself and just noting that we do have people dialing in from all across Australia and New Zealand today. There may be a mixed experiences in modern methods of construction based on the maturity of local markets. Uh, so to give some context, your group at the moment, the Office of Projects Victoria, is currently delivering the digital build to develop or to deliver a strong infrastructure pipeline in Victoria. I know personally I was lucky enough to be involved with some work with OPV recently, and it's great to see what's being developed. This has also included the recent publishing of a guide for offsite construction to facilitate more of an uptake in efficient and modern methods of construction. Can you share a little bit more with us around these guides that the Office of Project Victoria's has created and priorities and challenges that you see facing modern methods of construction? Thanks, Nicole, and uh, great questions. Um, I think let's start with uh, giving a bit of a context on how important it is to understand the challenges facing industry and the delivery of infrastructure more broadly. So we're facing a strained construction sector that is seeing increased amounts of government spending. I believe in Victoria this year it's about 20 billion uh, and nationally we're looking at about 50 billion of, of spending. So and that's to drive economic outcomes as well as social. I think it's it's pretty broadly known the disrupted and volatile supply supply chain work you have at the moment, and we're seeing that through increased escalation of construction materials and all sorts of disruptions in that supply chain. Um, but we also have increased client demands or government demands beyond the traditional areas of safety, quality, and environment into broader things like carbon, social outcomes, gender and diversity. So there's a lot of things that government's driving and wanting more from its infrastructure portfolio than traditionally it, it sought. And to meet all these demands, the Victorian government needs all the construction tools in its toolbox, uh, ready and available. And MMC, uh, Modern Methods of Construction, Offsite Construction, whatever you want to call it, we need to have that important tool 
um, and we've identified that as a, a tool we're not currently utilising in its full extent. I think Joyce mentioned that 5% were, and the potential is 40%. That's that's a great figure to sort of head towards and a great ambition. Um, so yeah, it's needed to deliver all the great projects that we want to do as government on time, on budget, and to great quality for Victorians and really drive that those social outcomes as well. You mentioned the digital bill program within the Office of Projects Victoria. That's been funded by government for 11 million to do to drive good practice, digital and offsite construction. And we're delivering things like guidance, training, policy and legal and commercial initiatives as well to drive change all together. So it's not just on the sort of the government policy space, but we're also looking at, you know, what are those things that we can do for, for government project teams to, to change how they look at projects? And then to have that then flow through to to our contracts as well to 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 support that um, that relationship between government and, and our contract and market. Um, Joyce and and Nicole, you initially helped us with uh, offsite construction and industry analysis, and so thank you for that. That was a great piece of work, and that was a review of current practice and a collection of expert feedback on what is blocking current uptake and what government can do to get MMC moving really. And one of the first recommendations was um, the guide and that's to better educate government project teams around MMC practices, successes and pitfalls, but also um, I'd say just to provide a bit of, a bit more tangible and practical advice and and one of the things that we've included in there is is a, is a like a offsite construction applicability tool which can help sort of break down those barriers for people to understand well is this really applicable for my project is this something I should be doing you know trying to help people bridge the gap between you know what they've the, what they've previously done to what they they could do in the future um so our offsite construction guide, which you mentioned, was was published by the treasurer. So that's a that's a huge tick of approval from from government and 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 a great sponsor we have in the treasurer. So please check our website. It's available publicly and available for download as well as the tool, uh, and is intended to support government project managers. But really, it could be applicable for anyone working in the industry, um, and that's there to understand MMC and make good or better decisions around um, early in a project or later in a project. Obviously, if it's later, it's harder to apply of of when and how to use it. Um, and we've had so much interest in that, even as far away as, as Canada, um, who who really are, are, are looking to publish a standard in offsite construction, which was, which was pretty good to say. Um, We've recently coupled that work with revised contract terms to standard government construction contracts. This enables alternative payment terms, better design interface management and IP retention to facilitate easier transactions between government and industry. So our remaining challenges that we're tackling this year are around driving industry investment in a volatile and unpredictable construction environment around securing larger programs of works and projects to help de demonstrate successful application. And lastly, continuing the education and demystification of clients and industry partners. So really trying to get people to understand what the benefits are and, and how this could be applicable for their projects. So if, um, if, if there's something that I haven't covered and if anyone listening has any bright ideas on what we could be doing um, that we're not doing, please reach out. Thanks very much, Luke. There's definitely a lot of work that's being done in that space, uh, and we will share the link through the, the Q&A to be able to assist people to find that information if they're wanting to read further about it. So as on the topic of challenges, and it's always, I guess, sometimes a difficult topic to talk about because we can focus too much on the challenges sometimes, but I am interested in hearing more from a builder's perspective, but also from a designer's perspective as to what the current challenges are being faced. So I'll start with yourself, Andrew, around from a builder's perspective, what are the challenges that you're facing in particular within the current procurement and implementation process that you've experienced on projects which include MMC? 
it's a really good question, Nicole. Um, oh, there's probably three items that I'll touch on here. The first one is um, from a Victorian point of view, there's probably only three or four key modular specialist contractors that have the ability to deliver the scale that we're seeing, uh, particularly on the pathway project in Victoria. So the idea of doing a detailed analysis of market capability in terms of actually delivering the modules is really important. Um, so there is no use lumping a large amount of scope with one contractor and putting all eggs in one basket. What we've found, particularly on Pathway, is it's so important to, um, to, to I suppose, refine the scope, minimise the amount of uh, delivery risk for certain contractors and make sure that uh, where there's the potential to actually split up the scope to make sure that um, the market doesn't get, um, I suppose, over, overwhelmed by the amount of um, supply chain issues, et cetera, split up the scope wherever we can across three or four contractors to make sure that there is certainty in, in delivery in terms of time and also cost. So yeah, first first point, uh, manage the scope, and make it manageable for the, the contractors involved. Um, the second point I'd make is, and this is a bit of a cliche, but really important, early involvement from a design point of view from you know both a contractor, but also the specialist modular contractors is paramount. And, and what I mean by that is getting involved, coming to the table, at a concept design uh, time. So, uh, you know, it, it's important that things like um, structural design, um, uniformity of structure, those issues need to be ironed out at concept design rather than let them flowing, you know, let them flow through until design development. Fundamentally, they are the issues that need to be. Uh, uh, resolved with contractor and specialist contractor at the table. We find that there's, you know, there, there's good ideas that can be thrown around um, in that collaborative environment, and so the engagement with the with the specialist contractors is really critical as early as possible. And that might be an ECI type engagement. It might be a, a fee for service type thing. Whatever it is, to get that, uh, you know, that input from from day one. Um, and probably thirdly, um, I think one of the key elements that we've learned on, on Pathway is the demarcation of um, level of fit out is really critical too. So what I mean by that is, do you go a cold shell type uh, build where you're building what we would call a cold shell module off site and then traditionally fitting it out on site? Now that goes against the whole yeah, you know, MMC hamburger with a lot approach, but there can be benefit in that in terms of whether it be IR issues, whether it be safety, whether it other things that come into play on specific sites. So demarcation of whether you do a, a cold shell type approach, um, whether you do a full fit out in the factory, um, it's ideal to do the full fit out. But again, if the design's not quite ready to enable that to happen early, um, then it would need to be watered down to a, a less advanced fit out. Certainly mo still modular construction, less advanced fit out and you do the rest on site. So key point there is clear definition of, of demarcation of you know what is fully fitted out. You know, are we waiting for FF and E, for example, to be selected? You know, do we have the time to wait? That decision needs to be made from a healthcare point of view. Um, yeah, really important that that, that demarcation is, is defined early. Thanks very much, Andrew. It really does, I guess, highlight the, the challenges around the timings of different aspects of the project from where the demarcation and where the line is drawn as to what's included. But it's also important to recognise that I think sometimes we tend to think of it's all or nothing, but there are different stages along the way that we can consider modern methods within it. It doesn't have to be everything, and it's finding that balance between availability, opportunity, uh, and actual timing that we have um, available. So if I can make one more comment there, uh, Nicole, I'm sorry to butt in. Um, That's all right. We have seen, we have seen obviously uh, issues, certainly during COVID with supply chain issues. So again, those issues drive the level of fit out that might be possible in this environment. You know, um, you know, steel, we've had issues with steel procurement, issues with primat board, issues with 
a certain timber products, et cetera. So that does inform the level of fit out that can be done um, you know, with, with program at the uh, forefront of mind. Um, there are a number of things COVID related that come into uh, into that decision as well. So from a from a supply chain material point of view, um, that can inform the demarcation as well. Yeah, a really interesting and important point to recognise there. And we are, I think we've all heard it before, but we are living in unprecedented times and it's about how do we adapt to the situation to make the most of what we've got available to us. So interested to hear from yourself, John, from a designer's perspective and are there processes or challenges and opportunities that you see that are different to those that builders face um, and what you can share with us? Yeah, I think um, I think it, a lot of it is similar, really, because you're it's uh, from our point of view is having a clear set of guidelines, a clear brief and and a and a signed off concept, I guess, um, prior to um, engaging in the, yeah, as long as it's within a, a guideline and a set approach, um, a structural grid that's consistent, etc. Um, the difficulty for us, I think, comes more around the early engagement with contractors um, and that sort of tender process at what point do you go to tender uh, on a project like this um, and then the flexibility of the design and the cost post tender is for us I find that the most uh, challenging area uh, we can design it all perfectly to a box that's 100% square and then the contractors come in and and supply material might be an issue um, so you've got to go from you know someone we've we've designed for steel um, someone says I actually precast or timber is the better way to go it, it then affects what we're doing and how we do it I think one of the other challenges is um, the 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 time expectation of a, a modular build is often thought of as a it's going to be a fast delivery system. Um, there's a lot of work up front, you know, over the entirety of the job. I'm not convinced unless you've got prefab elements that you've already pre-designed on previous projects that you're sort of lumping into the design. Um, you still need a lot of you still need a sort of a similar amount of time. Uh, you just put it at the front before you're on site. So the construction time will reduce significantly, but the actual design time is not necessarily that much shorter. So having that sort of, oh, let's build it out of modular, it'll get on, you know, we'll be able to start and finish in three months is not necessarily the case. So expectation of time, I think, is important. I think the other one is how you engage um, with the services and engineers on the projects and and the um, the commissioning of consultants to be doing a much higher level of documentation prior to going to tender or prior to construction where in what I'm meaning is that if you don't do all the BIM uh, coordination up front when you get into the world of uh, trying to work it out through the contractor and the and the subcontractors it's it gets very messy so i think we've with dnc we've been push pushing consultants to do less uh 100 documentation it's more um a dnc spec for one of a better i know it's more than that but in terms of it's not the you know the invert levels and all your hydraulic pipes kind of stuff it's it's more of a um uh you know comply with this idea but saying that you don't want to get so detailed before you go to tender that when you go to construct there's also a phase within there where there's an alignment of ideas of what the intent was to what the outcome will be because the they're not always going you know the the methods of construction will drive a certain aesthetic or 
or decisions around materiality or you know what we what we think is reasonable might need more tolerance depending on how you do the systems of construction and so they're the um, for me they're the main sort of early engagement clear brief get everyone on the same page but understand that it's not this quick fix um, that's I think that uh, pretty much covers it uh, thanks John so I think what we can see from those two perspectives is early engagement and understanding the the scope and what's included at each different stage is really important when you we're looking at these considerations is getting the right people in the room as early as possible, but also providing that flexibility in how can we actually make this possible and how can we make these compromises for this project to be successful using MMC. And as John said, the on-site benefits are quite significant, but there still does need to be that design focus and uh, conversations around how it's going to be put in place, which may not necessarily reduce the time in that sense. So. While we're talking about time and Luke, you started to touch on this earlier. We use we're used to the traditional method, I guess, of time versus top cost versus quality as that simplistic triangle as to where do we take priorities from. But what we're seeing today is the integration of it's no longer a triangle, it's more hexagonal or whatever heptagonal or whatever we want to call it, where we have to consider not only time, cost, quality, but also environmental, social governance aspects of projects. How or what role do you see the government playing in understanding, I guess, a prioritisation of these factors when it comes to government projects? And how can the government help drive the innovation within the MMC space? Mm. <laughs> really good question. And uh, as I was saying earlier, construction projects aren't just construction projects anymore. Government and well, actually, society expects a lot more of government from these projects as well. Um, and so government wants to squeeze in as many good outcomes as possible from every dollar spent. And, uh, and I say as citizens, we should expect that and uh, you demand that of, of every government expenditure. Um, and Government's already done a lot of good work around different policies that it's had in place, say Recycled First policy, local content, uh, recently published digital asset policy, um, all requiring projects to perform certain tasks. Most of these policy lead somewhat to MMC, uh, being a naturally selected method to be able to deliver on that. Um, with more ability to recycle, to use local manufacturers and to leverage digital tools and workflows. I, I think, um, you know, what John was saying around um, the, the importance of design, but having been a design engineer and, and then moving into construction, it's critical. Um, you know, you, you think about uh, if you rush too far into construction too early, it just means it's not that do those design activities just go away. It just means that the, those design activities just move to a construction site uh, and usually are a lot more costly to fix on that construction site than in a design office. Um, so it's about connecting the value of MMC to those target government outcomes that will drive uptake. Uh, and to your second question about innovation, while I don't think it's government's role to necessarily innovate in construction techniques and, de and delivery, what we can do is help enable innovation and value it in our assessment of bids, so value for money, and also enable our contracts, so change our contracts so it enables different approaches and innovation. Um, government project teams need to drive productivity and allowing their procurement program uh, procurement approaches for so new industry methods uh, to be more engaged with our delivery methods and alternatives and and you know stand up to those or brave the non-traditional systems uh, in this way will enable industry to do the innovation on the how and still get the outcomes in the in the what Thanks very much, Luke. And it is it is such a interesting balance between all the different components and I, I agree. I think innovation, there's a responsibility for us all to really think outside the bush, uh, 
think outside the box and push the boundaries as to what is possible and looking at how can we create more opportunities and I guess streamline processes on site through the, the through the design process. So we're going to talk it through now, I guess, a few related topics to modern methods of construction, um, not just specifically the process. So I'm going to jump um, in, I guess, looking at the procurement process that we have uh, around the, the timeline and the projects and what we work through. The, in discussions in preparation for this webinar, the panelists talked about how can we create a shared risk profile. So one of the, I guess, challenges facing modern methods of construction being implemented in projects is who shares or who takes the risk if they, with what happens. So I'm going to pick your brain on this, Joyce, around how can we create a more shared risk profile between the entities that are involved in MMC projects? Thanks, Nicole. I think that's a pretty tough question uh, to answer. So I guess our traditional procurement is very linear in nature and I guess very risk adverse. I, I don't think anyone in this forum would disagree with me on that. So and I see it, risk are passed along, which equates to cost and ultimately it is the end user or the asset custodian who has to pay for this extra cost and there's no real value added to their assets. And I guess another point to highlight is you know, a traditional procurement tends to be kind of one off and hence limiting in, you know, continuous innovation. So if we add, we try to add MMC into the equation, uh, it is unlikely to be a recipe for success. And I believe that the way around it is to rehaul our delivery model. Uh, we need to work on a more collaborative model where risk and rewards are actually shared. And the focus is on building a sustainable and effective relationships between all parties and an ongoing one as well. I think one of the key to unlocking this is to have all parties at the start of the project. I think this is what Andrew and John has mentioned earlier um, in, in their, in their you know, answer to their questions. Um, and also, I think jointly looking at a target outcome cost with the pain and gain share arrangement, you know, where costs below and above targets are actually shared you know, between parties. And also I think having to develop the right culture for the project with the right mentality, best for project attitude, rather than cost driven or program driven. And this will allow actually uh, to bring more innovations to the table and to allow the supply chain to actually take more risk uh, without being penalized on it. I guess as an example, I think UK is leading this by responding to, a new, uh, to this, I think, challenge with a new business delivery model uh, based on a more entrepreneurial approach to encourage and boost certainty and productivity in delivery and quality as well. Thanks very much, Joyce. It's important to be able to, I guess, look outside our own spheres to be able to understand what's happening in different areas as well. And that question, it was, a, it was a difficult question. Thank you for your response around, I guess, the opportunities that we have to create this shared risk profile and giving some practical examples as to how that could be implemented. As we're moving or as we're looking at this shift from the non-traditional method of procurement and method of construction to more with that MMC focus, interested to hear from yourself, Andrew, around what uh, what compliance challenges that you've seen when we when we make this shift to the MMC uh, projects and what has Lendlease done to mitigate these I guess or what could be implied in the future to be able to mitigate these compliance challenges? Yeah, another good question, Nicole. So one of one of the things that we have seen um, in our approach to modular in recent times that there have been there have been some technical issues that we've had to uh, get over one, one of them is is fire compliance in a in an mmc environment so um the whole fire engineering process um in a in a in an mmc environment is different to traditional construction and i don't think certainly from a from a, a healthcare sector point of view, I don't think as an industry we've got our head around what that means from a time and cost point of view. 
Um, so a learning for us certainly in that is that, you know, where we can do further testing in advance on certain systems, noting that tested solutions need to be specific for each, for, you know, for each project and each of the key parties involved in that process need to be aligned. Where we can do that in advance and, and in upfront to mitigate some of the uh, time delay, it's really important to do that. Um, coupled with that is the supply, again, the supply chain issues with things like, you know, Promat board, uh, vermiculite spray, some of those elements that are required to achieve a fire engineered solution have been difficult to get. So it, it's about yeah, having a common fire engineering strategy up front, doing the robust testing that is required to achieve compliance before the build starts, and then uh, you know um, being able to roll that out across other uh, you know other projects or other facilities. Um, you know, structural fire rating of structural steel has been a massive um, issue that we've needed to uh, get across on 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 pathway. A lot of promat, you know, a lot of vermiculite spray. And, and understanding how that works in a in a fire situation is, is really important. Um, the second, I think, and again, speaking technically, the, the second key issue that we has been an eye opener has been um, uh, lateral stability requirements in a modular environment. So what I mean by that is clearly there is a relationship between how the modules, the structural steel modules behave in an earthquake scenario versus how the in situ structure behaves. So in ground footings and and concrete cores are, are, are naturally required in any building. Um, but how that relates to the modular structure, you know, who owns the design um, and, and how the building operates in that scenario. Um, again, I think there's some learning to happen in that. Um, and you know whether we be, whether whether you beef up the modular structure, whether you beef up the in situ structure, how that happens, um, another learning curve. And I think we've we've got a bit of work to do in that, but certainly the lessons are there to be able to, uh, I suppose, be more efficient in that in that way as well. So there's definitely some challenges there from a compliance perspective, but it's great to be able to highlight. The, those challenges that you've seen so far uh, and others on the call may have experienced those as well. So looking at those potential solutions as Andrew just um, described to us. Another area that we're seeing, I guess, a very strong link between modern methods and um, decarbonisation or carbon tracking. So this links into your question, Gerard, that you posted in the chat and I'm going to direct this one to yourself, John, around looking at ways in which you're currently seeing within Woods Bagot integrating carbon tracking into your projects and how can modern methods assist in increasing this opportunity uh, in terms of tracking? I think it's there's sort of two parts to this. One is um, in the design phase of projects and, and this applies to us, whether it's modular or not. Um, we're looking at ways of integrating carbon values into our um, Revit programs and and adding that as another layer of information into our systems so that we can then assess uh, the value of carbon uh, in the building um, so we can actually quantify some of this um, information. The other one is um, a question around within the terms of modular where uh, true carbon sits. Um, you can do, I mean, to to talk about non-volumetric um, modular construction. So, you know, a curtain wall is a modular construction element. It might be supplied, built in, in China, shipped out here uh, with all the other bits and pieces that go with it. Is that more carbon in, in uh, inclusive than a product that's made in Australia. So it's it's choosing the right materials and the right supply for the elements that you're doing. So it, it, I don't think it, I don't I don't know that the carbonisation is any greater in modular than 
non-modular. I think there are more benefits, sustainability in terms of waste, in terms of um, being able to, uh, you know, laser cuts stuff out so that there's zero waste. I know we did Meadowbank School recently um, and Roberts were building that with, at the same time they were building uh, Concord Hospital. They produced about 50% less waste out of um, Meadowbank than they did on on Concord. And that was because we did a lot of prefabricated um, mechanical services. We did a lot of prefabricated wall types. We did uh, prefabricated ceiling um, modules. Um, and so you can actually reduce carbon um, by collection of material use and application. Um, and it's always a, it's always a cost conversation as well um, around what people are willing to do within the the process. I think one thing that we haven't really talked about here is also um, a, a clear value management process is something that's super important in these projects, and not in a way that value management means cost cutting. Um, it's it's the real value of products and materials and speed versus time versus sustainability versus um, the the risks on site and and how we do everything cohesively. Um, having that system in place, I think will go a long way to help um, deal with the fluctuation in cost that we go through in these sorts of projects that Joyce was talking about. Um, where we where we can, we need to be nimble in how we deal with all the issues that come up in the process. I don't know whether that answers the question, but um, no, very nicely. Thanks, John. And, and interesting around the the value management side of things as well. And I think that's value management on construction projects is usually around cutting costs, but it can be looked at from a different perspective and looking at, well, where can we add value in different areas uh, based on different stages of the project, based on the materiality or looking to reduce the wastage. So I think they're really important points to be able to, to consider when we're going down this pathway. And I'll go back to you. John, did you have something else to add? Just, just one more is um, that there, there is, um, if you do the, the volumetric work and um, make it deconstructable, um, there is another value that you can, in, in reusing uh, modular construction is quite a important part of what we've been looking at in the schools infrastructure world. The Fern Bay product was a, was a product that was of quality with the same um, uh, systems and quality of a normal uh, classroom that would be built today, um, but it can be taken apart, relocated. It's not a demountable. It's not, you know, you just pick it up and put it on the back of a truck, but it is able to be reused. And I think the elements within, if you can, if you can get those in there, that that will help a lot of um, carbon usage. You know, the the ability to reuse. Sorry. Uh, oh, good. Thanks very much, John. And it's an yet another aspect of modular that needs to be thought about, or has we have the opportunity to think about. It's looking at the entire life cycle of the designs that we're going through. It's not just a design once for a specific location. It's looking at the entire um, yeah, life cycle of the materials, the components, and where it could be used elsewhere. So linking into that quite nicely, thanks, John, is the concept of asset management. And this is an area I think that's being becoming more closely linked to modern methods and looking at the potential to integrate asset management tools into modular projects. And Joyce, what's what are your thoughts around the potential collaboration between asset management and asset tracking with MMC? Yeah, I think there are significant benefits in integrating both uh, MMC and asset management, uh, especially you know, 
just mentioned that you know the expectation uh you know of the assets you know has increased tremendously it's not just about construction it, it is about the quality of the asset at the end of the day so and we know for a fact that i guess mmc carried out in a controlled environment actually produces better quality products and components so ultimately it creates a better assets um, and it performs a lot better as well. And as um, John mentioned, um, you know, it doesn't really matter whether it's temporary or permanent. Um, this is the expectations of the end users at the end of the day. And also with MMC, right, we have the opportunity to embed technology within the assets. So it gives us actually the opportunity to uh, measure the building's performance in real time. So the data that is collected can actually be used to improve the design for future projects. And I think the, the last point I'd probably like to make is MMC has the opportunity to, to be designed for this assembly. Um, so the components during the operational phases can be easily replaced, you know, without major disruptions uh, to the operations of, of a building. And also towards the end of the asset life cycle, the components can be, you know, dismantled, you know, recycled or reused. So as I said before, I think there is great synergies that we need to actually link both MMC with the asset management um, life cycle. Yeah. Thanks very much, Joyce. I think there's, as we're seeing through this discussion, there's not only the links between industry, government, uh, designers, contractors, there's also links to different areas of focus such as asset management, decarbonisation, such as looking at value management and creating, I guess, the conversations around the time quality cost is one aspect, the environmental social governance is another, and weighing up and having these conversations as early as possible to figure out what the best approach is for that project, um, but considering it through the full life cycle of the design uh, implementation and then decommissioning at the end. So I'm going to throw to some a question that's come through and direct this towards yourself, Andrew, around the uh, market capability. So a question's come through with Will better market capability encourage the use of modern methods of constructions on big projects such as Footscray or Frankston, assumingly within the health space? And does the method of procurement influence the uptake of modern methods? Yeah, certainly there's only, I think I mentioned earlier, there's only uh, a small handful of contractors who have the ability to um, get their head around the healthcare environment in terms of what makes up a healthcare building from a modular point of view. Um, there is a fair bit of work to be done to get other contractors sort of up to speed, different in an education environment where probably the, the level of fit out um, is less complicated to a healthcare environment. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers the first part of that. Sorry, Nicole, the second part of that was the uh, second part of the question. Uh, does the oh. method does the method of procurement influence the uptake of MMC? Yeah, I think it does. Um, you know, we've we've seen uh, in our involvement on, for example, if, if I use a managing contractor type uh, method of procurement, MC versus a PPP, MC tends to be a bit more collaborative, and and I suppose. Um, talking to what Joyce touched on in terms of best for project, collaborative, um, I think MC hits that sweet spot in terms of, you know, being aligned with all the key stakeholders. Um, so absolutely, I think there is benefit in, um, you know, that, that MC type approach in a modular environment versus a PPP, which is um, a, a bit, given that the nature of um, the sort of consortia approach in a PPP slightly different to the MC. So it absolutely informs, um, you know, the, the direction in which M MMC would head. Hopefully that answers that question. Yes, very much so. They, thanks very much for that, Andrew. So there was one more question that, that's come through. Um, which will be be shown in the chat um, momentarily is looking at I guess going back to the conversation around risk and the sharing of risk. It is a it is an interesting topic to be able to 
I guess, go into more detail on now what is and looking at it, it's looking at agreeing that to allow for offsite construction, the degree needs to be completed or to, to be discussed around the shared risk profile to a higher extent or to a greater extent. We're looking to see, and I'll open this up to anyone that is interested in answering, to understand what the risks are that could be shared between people, uh, between groups within a project. So what type of risk could we actually look at discussing in, in more detail and being able to share um, from a contractual perspective? I mean, it, it, I can start, John, and then maybe you can uh, expand for the design elements. Um, Thanks, Luke. <laughs> risk, risk is always a great question. Um, I'm a firm believer in risk minimisation um, before you actually get to a, to a contract. Um, but I'd say a lot of the risk elements, and we've highlighted them in our offsite construction guide from a technical perspective, say, um, things just about understanding tolerances of design and construction. You, you know, you're building it offsite. It needs to interface clearly with what you have on, like your footings, foundations, um, hold down bolts, you know, all those type of things. Even even making sure that, for instance, if you've got any particular bit of equipment or asset that needs to, you know, be inserted accurately in place, have things like templates, um, have a, a, a good degree of quality assurance, quality compliance on site as well. To make a simple thing is make sure your hold down bolts are, are vertical, not off on an angle. So it, make, it makes it impossible for you to install equipment and, and do all those type of things. From a, And making sure you have enough, you've gone through and thought through your sort of craneage. Um, you've understood the risks there. You've got adequate squat space. You've got adequate, adequate um, you know, um, space on your site or construction site to be able to move these things into position and be able to add them up and also those interfaces with an operational or live environment as well that needs to be thought through and understood by the operational area for instance a school or a hospital sometimes they're working in live environments so try and work out you know how that interfaces with what they're trying to do and get that agreement and and have a almost like a daily discussion and see if there's anything that changes um, and there's a whole lot of commercial risks that you can go into it, but I don't think that was the um, the premise of the question. I, th I think I'll stop there. No, I appreciate that. And just noting, we have four minutes left, so I will um, take that question. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll say that we've, we've answered that one for now and be able to move into just, I guess, wrapping up the conversation. So thank you for your response on that, Luke, and for the question that came through. So with three minutes to go, I'd like to just, I guess, look towards the future and look at what is the future of modern methods of construction in Australia and New Zealand, or what are the next steps for your business or area of work? So I'll work through our, our speakers. So I'll start with yourself, John. What do you see as the future of MMC in Australia and New Zealand? I, you know, I think it's very positive. I think, you know, the, to, quickly chat about the, the risk component. It, I think it does reduce a lot of risk on site. I think there's more risk up front than in the construction phase. I mean, there are risks, obviously, whenever you build anything. I think it um, gives us a good ability to get an equitable solution to um, uh, public buildings in particular that um, are very positive toward the, the um, say, in the school sector, where you're getting a consistent level of quality across multiple schools and regions in the community. I think the quality is a is a very positive um, opportunity where we can get good quality um, materials and, and outcomes out of the um, these modern methods of construction process. So I, I, I think there's a lot of value in, and we obviously are embedded in some of these areas where we do need to, um, uh, we see the value in doing the, the the modular level of construction. Thanks very much, John. Uh, Luke, what are your final thoughts on the future of MMC in Australia and New Zealand? I'd say it's bright. Um, I think it's growing awareness 
Um, I, th I think there probably needs to be more education. Like if we're looking at 100 different sites and we come up with 98 different designs, I don't think that's necessarily, th we're going to see the full benefits from, from that. So I think it's just this growing discussion around how do you get government designers, contractors to to come to a you know a balanced understanding of, of how we all play together better, um, and that doesn't need to be a, a contract um, method that we're we're going down for collaboration. It could be could be any procurement method, but um, yeah, I think it's bright, and I think there's a there's a lot of things in to work out though. But uh, I think there's a growing appetite for this. Thanks, Luke and Andrew. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree with with Luke and John. I think the future is bright um, with a few caveats on that. I think um, it definitely it needs to take a site by site uh, approach. So, you know, it, there are some sites that are that are um, better suited to MMC versus others. So, you know, clearly specific analysis on what what the site is and how it might work from an access point of view, from a lay down point of view, from a public interface point of view, number of things to work through there. So that would be the first, um, the first, I suppose, disclaimer. Secondly, I mentioned fire engineering. Whilst it sounds like a small issue, it is a big issue that needs to be analysed across each sector. So there's, there's work to be done from that point of view in terms of MMC. Um, structural interface, I mentioned the interface between the in-situ structure and the modular structure. Um, as an industry, we need to get that right. And again, across each sector, how that how that works. Um, and then finally, um, I suppose what is it, asking ourselves, what does it mean to take a cookie cutter approach across each sector? So that'll be that'll be different in an education environment to what it is in a healthcare environment. Um, what does what does uniformity and cookie cutter mean for each sector? If we can answer that, I think that um, puts us ahead of the game in terms of making this more beneficial moving forward. Thanks very much, Andrew and Joyce. Did you have any final final statement um, from your standpoint as to the future of MMC? Yeah, I think echoing what the panelists have just commented, uh, and back to my original um, comment as well, I believe the, the future is promising. And for the in the fact that, you know, we all come together now and having this frank and open conversation about it, it indicates collaboration. And I think that's the way we, we need to go moving forward. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Joyce. And thank you to all our panellists. Apologies, we we're, we're one minute over time. Uh, so nearly right on time. So thank you all for attending and the session today. We hope that you found it to be a valuable and enjoyable discussion. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions following the event and we appreciate all your time today. So I think from this discussion, there's a lot of promise and hope with integrating me modern methods of construction more into our industry. And I look forward to being involved in that uh, change moving forward. Thank you all and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>